We are glad to have you guys with us this morning. Um, hopefully, as you have been sitting around the table, you've gotten to meet some new friends um, that are in the similar situation as you, or maybe a different um, life situation, but you all have talked about the commonalities of having a student um, coming to Baylor here this fall. My name is Megan Becker. I'm the Director of Care Team Services, and I'm glad to be with you this morning, and I'm here uh, with my colleague, Dr. Jim Marsh. Well, good morning. It is good to be with you. Uh, my name is Jim Marsh, and I'm the Dean for Student Health and Wellness, and I'm also the Executive Director of the Counseling Center. And so as we get started, we always like to get a sense of who is here in the audience with us. So if this is your first time sending a student to college, raise your hand, our rookies. All right, strong showing this morning for the rookie class, okay. Now, if you've done this before, you have, uh, you sent a student off to college before, let's raise your hand, our veterans. All right, it's pretty good even split. Rookies, all right, find a veteran, right, exchange phone number, <laughs> form your own little support group, whatever you need to do. Now, for this uh, third group, really important group, one that I became a member of last year, where are my empty nesters, right? Where are you? I, I need to see two hands, right? All right. Now, I've got to be honest about this group, right? Here's what I found is that, you know, for some of the empty nesters, you know, I mean, 10 minutes after you drop your kids off, you, you barely remember that you had children, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then for others, that's kind of a, it was a, it's a hard adjustment. I mean, I'll be honest, we had, a, we had a little harder adjustment than I thought we would. I remember our son, <clears throat> after he'd been gone about three days, you know, he called us and he said he had forgotten something really important. And my wife and I, you know, we were never happier, right? Because we now had a reason, an excuse to go see him that Saturday. So maybe there's a strategy there. Maybe you can slip something out of the packing list. I <laughs> give you a reason to go see him pretty quick. Um, but really, you know, your, your students, what a, what a great time, what a great transition. You know, your students are going to be growing in so many ways. Right? They're going to be managing time at a whole new level, uh, making new friends, relationships, you know, managing finances at a new level, clarifying values. You know, something we talk about here at Baylor is that uh, we really focus on helping students find a sense of purpose in life. We refer to that as calling. And we just believe that you, as parents, are uniquely qualified to help them make this transition. Right? So your work's not done yet. Your research tells us that for students whose families stay engaged with them during college, they have two really good outcomes. One of those is they make higher grades, and the other is that they graduate at higher rates. So, your work's not done yet. Um, before I get started in the actual presentation, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if you all got the yellow pens when you walked in, our friends from uh, the Department of Parent Engagement have provided those pens, and you all are thinking we might have given you a broken pen because you can't figure out how to get the ink out. Um, but they're not broken. They do indeed work. You just push the silver thing up and down. See, clickety-click, I hear it. Um, you push the silver thing up and down, and that is how you get the ink to, um, to come out and work. And then also, um, you're welcome to take pictures of this PowerPoint um, as we're presenting, but it is also in the Baylor app. If you downloaded the orientation app, the PowerPoint is in that app. So you're welcome to take pictures, but you also have access to that as well. So today we're going to talk about shaping expectations, things that students want you, your students want you to know, things that you need to know about your students' first year, things we want you to know, and then some transitions, um, and then we'll have question and answer will be available for that after afterwards. When I went to college several years ago, I didn't go to Baylor, but I was at orientation, and um, the guy there we were in kind of a Waco Hall type setting, and. <clears throat> the orientation leader, uh, the man in charge, was like, okay, raise your hand to, to all the students. Raise your hand if you were a football player. Ah, raise your hand if you're a cheerleader. Ah, raise your hand if you're top 10%. You know, at baseball, theater, you know, he's like going through the list and everyone's like going crazy, so proud of all the things that they did. And then he says into the microphone, nobody cares. <laughs> like wah wah you know like that, that that those days are done 
Um, and it's kind of the same way, it's kind of the same way with you all as parents, right? You're no longer the baseball dad, the theater mom, the cheerleader mom, the high academic achiever dad. You, those days are done, right? The ways that you have kind of identified yourself with your student um, over the last several years, it's not that way anymore. And not to be, not to be rude, but nobody cares about the things. Uh, I say that in the most loving Baylor way that I can. Uh, but it, it's just not about those things anymore. And so now you are the parent of a college student. And those things are different. And those transitions are different. And it's not that we don't celebrate those things but it's just not about those things anymore. And it's not about you anymore. It's now about transitioning to this adulthood for your college student and really identifying as the parent of an adult college student and what that means for um, you and your student. Um, students need parents who are genuinely interested in what they're doing in college. Um, who celebrate with them the opportunity to go to college. Um, this has been a big deal for them to get to this place, and so they need parents who celebrate those things. Um, students need parents who recognize changes um, in them, and um, our hope and desire is that the student you drop off in August of 2022 is different than the student you pick up in May of 2023. That really is the, the hope and desire for us. Um, like Jim, I had a daughter go to school um, last year. She actually is the student on the far left who spoke on the panel yesterday, the student panel. Um, but it was a big deal for me, and I will tell you that she is a different person after her freshman year than she was when I dropped her off. And it was a bit of a transition. I, I like Jim, it was sometimes difficult for me to recognize that she was changing and becoming her own person. Um, but it's a beautiful thing to watch and they need parents who recognize that they're gonna change. Um, and they need parents who are gonna stay in touch and show interest in their lives. Jim's gonna talk a little bit about that and the, the um, expectation about staying in touch. Students don't need parents who um, act as though they're losing something when they go to college. Um, we, you, we know you all are losing something, but they don't need you to remind them of that. You can talk to your husband or your wife or your best friend or your parents about that, but they don't need that constant, or constant reminder. Um, and they need, need parents who are going to, um, they don't appreciate parents who talk who don't listen and talk at them. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, students don't need parents who don't let them make their own decisions. Um, this is a big time of decision making and what that means, and so we'll talk um, a little bit about that too. Um, and uh, they certainly don't need parents who continuously remind them how much this is costing you. Um, we are all aware of how much Baylor costs. And so your student doesn't need that constant reminder. Again, you can talk to your husband or your wife or your best friend or your parents about those things, but they don't need that constant reminder. And they also don't need parents who visit too often or visit without calling. So if you plan on showing up in their residence hall lobby every Saturday morning at nine o'clock, you know, you might want to scrap that plan and come up with something different. Um, so here you are, August of 2022 on I-35 with 812 of your closest friends and a little bit of construction. And um, you've had a cool front the past two days. You're welcome. Um, it'll be a little bit warmer when you come in August. Um, and sadly, the construction will um, still be here. Um, but, but here you are um, about to send your student off. And, and this is really an opportunity <clears throat> for you all to celebrate with them all that they have accomplished and that they're finally getting to do it, right? Um, I, I say about this um, class, their high school experience has been pretty tainted, um, defined a little bit by the global pandemic, and it has been a hard thing for them. Their sophomore and junior years were greatly impacted um, by COVID and all that that was, and then coming out of it their senior year and just the changes and adjustments, and just getting to college in general is a big deal. 
And so this really is an opportunity for you all to celebrate with them that they've made it and they're ready for this journey. So a question, does anyone here know how many days from now until move in? Oh, no, oh, man. Oh, I hear him. I hear him. Oh, you hear somebody? I was getting a little concerned about this group, right? It's a little early to be in denial. <laughs> um, so, did, did somebody say something? 60-something. Yeah, you're playing the 65 days, right, to that first day of moving. So, 65 <laughs> days, right? And some of you are having a sense of shock right now. It's like you've been thinking about it. 65 days. Now, typically, the way this goes early on in orientation, everyone seems to know, but it's, it's so interesting. The closer we get through the summer to actual move-in, no one seems to know how many days until moving, right? Well, it's coming, it's coming up, and uh, it's a great, awesome time. Uh, just a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of excitement. Uh, don't be misled. There's a little layer of anxiety underneath uh, for the students, certainly for the parents, and it's there as well. But we really want your students to get off to a great start. Right, and we have set everything up to do this. I mean, beginning with orientation, it's designed to help your student to get off to a great start. Going to line campus, another step in getting off to a great start. And then when they come here, we, we know how important it is. So I wanna talk a little bit about how to do that. Uh, when my youngest son went off to college uh, last year, yeah, I said to him, I said, hey, listen, you need to do two things, right? I'm just trying to make it simple. You need to do two things, number one, you need to find your people. You need to find your community, right? And number two, you need to make good grades, right? You just need that. You don't have to make a 4.0, right? But you just need to anchor that GPA in a real solid kind of way. So here's a few things that, that you can, as you talk to your students, can help them with. How, how do you find your people? Well, number one, you know, a great way to start is just knowing who uh, your CL is in the residence hall. Now, there's a lot of code at Baylor. CL stands for community leader. And this is the student who lives there in the residence hall, uh, you, know, you know, with your student. And they, they're really a great connection of what's going on on campus, right? So it's just a good person for them to know. It's a good person for you to know. And they can really help them make those connections. Uh, the, the other thing I would say uh, about making connections is encourage your student to stay on campus over the weekend, right? And just, just say, hey, why don't we just do it for the first four weeks at least, right? Uh, stay on campus over the weekend. Here's why. It's all the weekends, they're in the residence hall where all those connections, all those memories uh, are made, right? And we know that too, so we kind of set up things that we know they can make some connections. It's on the weekends, you know, that's where all the local college ministries, if students are connecting, you know, they're making those connections and it's a great time to do that. So it's just really important. I've been, I'm a psychologist by training. I've worked in the counseling center for over 20 years. Uh, and it's something we'll see, you know, every year, you know, kind of early October, we have students who walk in and they feel isolated, they feel lonely, they feel disconnected. Now we can help them with that, right? We can overcome that. But what do I find almost 100% of the time, right, when I ask, well, I started going home, beginning with that first weekend, right? So anyway, encourage them to stay, be here. There are, there are people here who want to meet your uh, student, and they just got to be here and show up for that. The other thing I would say is um, there, there's a million ways to get involved, right? There's, there's 300 and something student organizations. I would say just pick two things. Pick two things that you are really interested in and invest in those, right? That's probably how much time you'll have, is pick a couple of those things. Maybe it's a, it's a, it's a college ministry, or maybe it's some kind of you know, uh, fellowship here on campus. You know, it's one of those great student orgs that's related to your major. But pick two, invest, show up, and be there, and really make some connections with like-minded people, and that's a great way to do that. Um, something about uh, grades, um, and one thing I would say, and I know this seems obvious, uh, but, um, you know, go to class, right? And you're thinking, well, that's why I've sent them here, right, is to go to class. But research tells us that attendance, especially in the first five weeks, is a significant predictor of your final grade, right? So it's all about that front load, show up, be present, even if you're tired, just get there and sit in the seat kind of thing, right? It really helps with that final grade. And then I want to say a little bit about um, communication there at the beginning of the year. I realize that some of you will have 50 texts 
from your student before lunch today, some of you will not hear from them, right, until you meet them at the end of the day. I, that's how that goes, right? What I would say, though, is whenever you drop your student off, right, if they don't call you or text you as much as you would like, when they do call, don't give them the lecture about how much they haven't called, right? Let's all agree right now. Let's all agree right now. We're going to let it go. We're going to let it go. We're not going to do it. We're not going to go there, all right? Because I can promise you one thing. Your student will need you at some point. They are going to need you at some point, and you want them to feel like they can call you and not get that lecture. I did not do very good on this part. <laughs> all, all, the whole first semester, I kept thinking, uh, hearing Jim's voice saying, don't give the lecture, don't give the lecture. But she was living her best life 20 minutes from me and never came home. So, which is fine, which is great. She had a great experience. So I just wasn't very good at that. So I don't know if you know, but um, Baylor has kind of, I mean, Waco has kind of um, gotten on the map for um, home decorations. Chip and Joanna have kind of put us um, on the map for Fixer Upper and all of the things Magnolia. Um, I'm not here to give any um, home decorating tips or anything like that, but I do um, want to talk about just if you're going to, um, you might be thinking maybe you're in the empty nest stage and you're like, oh my gosh, I have another room in the house that I can do something with. The craft room, the media room, the workout room, or even worse, the younger siblings uh, bedroom but if you're gonna do something like that just remember to bring your students into those conversations and I mean that's kind of a silly example about redecorating the room but nothing will erode their confidence worse than they come home at fall break for the first time and they're like hey oh here's the media room or something like that <laughs> And so just making sure that you're bringing them into those bigger conversations just because they're away at college doesn't mean that they're totally not a part of the family anymore and that, that you all are just moving and you know moving and shaking and they're just kind of here but just making sure you bring them into the big decisions that you're making and the big family conversations that you would have typically brought them into just remember that they still want to be a part of those decisions and those conversations and are still a part of the family <clears throat> and talking about decisions um, you know, this really is, I talked a little bit about this at the beginning, but this really is a big time for a bunch of new decisions, right? So they wake up, they have to figure out, one, can they wake up on their own without somebody waking them up? What time do they wake up? How long is it going to take them to get to class? Are they going to eat um, breakfast before they, gonna, before they go to class? Are they going to eat breakfast after they go to class? Are they going to eat at Penland? Are they going to eat at East Village? Are they going to eat with their friends from line camp? Are they going to eat with their friends from the hall? Are they going to get it to go? Are they going to get it? Uh, are they going to eat there? Not to mention when you get into the dining halls, the 400 choices of things that there are um, to choose from. Um, and is this a healthy choice? Is this not a healthy choice? And then it's lunchtime. And then am I going to go to lunch at Penland? Am I going to go to Brooks College? Am I going to eat with my friends from line camp? You know, just all of these things. And then am I going to, how am I going to get to class? I have to make the decision. Am I going to go this way? Am I going to meet a friend? What am I going to do all day long? They're making these new decisions. And then you have the afternoon am I going to take a nap am I going to do laundry am I going to study we don't want them to take a nap but um, you know what all of these big decisions that they're starting to make and those the ones I just mentioned are the easy decisions right those are the ones that are kind of like for us we're like yeah duh, you have to eat but they are still a, a thing but they're also starting to make decisions um, about friends that they're hanging out with, big decisions about ways that they're spending their time. Um, they're starting to think about decisions that with their major, are they you know, sitting in these education classes and they think, you know, I don't really like kids that much or I don't really, you know, they're in biology classes and they're hating it and they don't really like blood and they're like, you know, maybe pre-med isn't for me. You know, but really these bigger decisions that they're starting to make and so, just remembering as the parent um, that you, you really have an opportunity to empower them to begin to make their own decisions. And they might be making some decisions and you think, you know, I don't know that that's the best choice or the best use of your time. But really, I would encourage you not to say anything because it's really an opportunity for them to figure out how to stand on their own two feet and make decisions. In the past, 
Um, parents of college students have been called helicopter parents. You know, they kind of hover and make sure everything is okay. But um, a new phrase for that is bulldozer parents, or um, for those of you from up north, snow plow parents, where you just kind of plow the way for them and make sure that everything is okay and that there aren't going to be any bumps in the road. But the reality is there's not going to be anybody plowing the way for them when they get into the real world, right? And so let college be a time when they make decisions on their own and don't have anyone plowing the way. And sometimes they might make decisions that aren't the best, but they're gonna learn from that and become different people on the other side of those lessons of learning. And so kind of like the communication, letting it go, decision making, let your students make decisions on their own and we just have to let it go. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about the fall semester. And you just need to know that the fall semester, it just feels long. It eventually feels long for students. It feels long for those of us who work here. The main reason is we really don't have, really don't have any breaks in the fall semester until we, until we get later on. Spring semester, very different, lots of breaks. I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Um, so um, probably somewhere there, uh, you know, early September, your student might have a first quiz or something like that. Uh, September 16th and 17th is family weekend. You might want to write that down and say, hey, that's going to be the first time we're going to come back to campus if you haven't been back. But somewhere there, maybe late September, certainly by the beginning of October uh, at that point, <clears throat> your student is going to have their first major grade, their first major exam. Now, my first grade in college was a 41. I made a 41 on a political science exam. And uh, I can tell you, I had never made anything close to a 41 in my life. I remember I had to make a 98 and a 96 on the last two exams to have a C in that class. Now, that is a lot of work, you know, for a C. Now, my parents, you know, when I made that 41, right, my parents had this conversation with me and, you know, and, and uh, they said, hey, look, you wouldn't be there unless you could do the work, right? And that goes the same for every student here. Hopefully none of, none of your students make a 41 or anywhere close to that. But if they do, you may have to have that same conversation, which is, hey, you wouldn't be at Baylor unless you could do it. And that's a true statement, right? I just think that the fall semester is its a period of adjustment. It's a big transition. It's really different from high school. And that, <clears throat> that fall semester, students are really trying to figure out, so how do I, how do I kind of pace everything, right? You know, and, and how, how do I do this? I really feel like November is probably the hardest month of the whole year, right? It's that point in the semester, in the fall, you know, where everything comes due, papers, projects, assignments, and they kind of really feel that. You know, if they stayed on top of it, it's a little better. You know, if they're still trying to figure it out, they're going to they're gonna feel the stress of, of November as, as it comes up. Just know that. It's a great time for your care package and those sorts of things. Uh, Baylor, we have great resources here. Hopefully you uh, had a chance to uh, see all the different things that we do for students. And I think to myself, at what other point in your life do you have all these people who are professionals and their, their job, they are paid to help you be successful, right? I mean, when else do you get that, right? So take advantage, you know, the writing center, the academic center, and the, all the different services that are there, and certainly take advantage of them a little earlier on rather than, uh, than later. Uh, so I wanted, at this point, I wanted to make a couple of comments, uh, and it may seem obvious, but I'll tell you why I make them. And, and the first one is, college is hard, right? College is hard, right? You know, uh, if it was easy, you know, it's that kind of saying, if it was easy, everyone would be able to do it. I mean, it's hard. And because it's hard, doesn't mean your student doesn't belong here, right? I've been in this kind of this work for 20 something years now and I've seen this shift right this sort of thinking that well because it's hard I, I you know I don't I don't belong there and I'm thinking who, who, where did you pick that up you know who told you that right yeah it's gonna be hard it's gonna be a challenge but it's a good thing right right that's a sign that this is something worth doing right it's a noble thing and it should be this way and you know, it shouldn't be you know just easy all the time right the other thing is your students are going to be stressed at times they're just going to be stressed at times. 
And that doesn't mean that something's wrong with them, right? Again, I've kind of seen this shift to where, oh, I'm stressed, therefore something's wrong with me. And it's like, no, there's not anything wrong. That's kind of part of it. You're learning, growing, you're, you're making some adjustments. There was an article came up very recently that said one third uh, of today's college students consider withdrawing from the university. A third consider leaving the university. And why do you, what do you think the, the reason is? I'm stressed, right? So we need to try to flip the script and change the, the narrative uh, around that. So some of you might get a text or an email um, like this asking um, for a little bit of extra funding for the 900 t-shirts that they will have uh, when they come home or um, going out um, and so your student really might um, communicate with you in some subliminal ways and then you'll call your student um, and you'll and you'll say hey how's it going and they'll be like this is the worst decision I ever made the food in the dining halls is disgusting I can't stand the lasagna my roommate fights we, we fight all the time she snores she uses my clothes this is terrible I haven't made any friends I can't figure out where to study my professors aren't nice this is the worst decision I ever made and you're like, oh, okay, so you listen like you have done for all of these years, and then um, you call them back in 20 minutes and like, hey, how are you doing now? Oh my gosh, this is the best decision I ever made. My roommate and I get along great. The food in the dining halls is awesome. My professors are great. My roommate and I share everything. It's going great. I love studying in the library. This is the best decision I've ever made. And it's like, you know, kind of this emotional whiplash roller coaster, like, oh, for those of you who have students who ha have already gone to college, you know that that is kind of the case. It's like, wow, okay. Um, but really, what we, do, what we encourage you to do is to listen to the conversations about lasagna, because your students might also call you and talk to you about things a little bit more significant than the food in the dining halls. And they might not come out and say that they're struggling, but you as a parent, <clears throat> know that they are struggling and that they have things um, that are going on with them. In this generation, we know from um, research and statistics and things that we have read and heard that mental health issues are becoming um, more prevalent in this generation, and so your student might really have some struggles that they're experiencing and some things that are that are going on for them that are difficult for the first time and so we encourage you to listen but don't feel like you have to hop in the car from san antonio and come straight to waco or get on the plane from massachusetts and head straight here there are people here at baylor who care deeply about your students when they are struggling with things a little bit more significant than the lasagna in the dining halls. Um, the counseling center is available. There's folks in the residence halls that are available 24 seven. There are people here that care about your students and remember that you don't have to be the one to come and help right away, that we are here to help them when they call you with those subliminal messages or when they call you telling you they're struggling. So I want to talk about the end of the fall semester as we come into the Thanksgiving uh, week. One of the things that Baylor changed a couple of years ago was the students now have that entire week off, and that's great. They get a full week off. Uh, many students will go home, right? Uh, but some students may choose to stay. Residence halls will be open. We recognize that, you know, for some people have to travel a great distance to, to, to come home for that week and then to here a couple weeks and then do it again at the end of the semester might be a bit much um, and I'm sure you'll be glad to see your students they'll be glad to see you and uh, it will it will it should be a time of hey, catching up and getting ready uh, for finals you know and most students they do fine uh, on finals I think the ones who struggle are the ones who really just don't stay healthy uh, during that part of the year uh, I think one of the things that's really important for students and and you know, if I could change one thing, I mean, if somebody said, hey, Jim, you can change one thing about students, what would you change? And it would be how much they sleep. I know that seems simple, but there's so much research, you know, connected to it. Uh, you know, 16-year-old to early 20s really need seven to nine hours uh, of sleep. Uh, you know, college students, you know, I'm like, hey, just give me seven, right? At least give me the bottom of that, uh, the bottom of that range. And, and kind of here's why. The first four hours that you sleep, right, it's this physically restorative rest, 
beginning in hour five, you start to get a little, something we call REM sleep. You've probably heard of it. You get a little bit then, a little more, hour six, more in hour seven, more in hour eight. That's kind of your biggest chunk of growth. Well, REM sleep is where you get all the great cognitive benefits, right? You, you Memory consolidation, everything you've been working on is consolidated into memory for the test. I mean, how many people have gone to sleep thinking about something, you wake up in the morning, you've got an answer. It's, it's just it's just your brain does that. It's amazing, but we have to give it a chance to do you know, what it was created uh, to do. Um, the other thing I would say about this time of year, uh, you know, and I realize that some of you are thinking, well, I, I don't even know where my student's going to live, you know, in August, right? You're still trying to figure that out. But that decision about where they're going to live their sophomore year, right, comes up very, very quickly. Um, and at least by early December. I mean, I would say, you know, probably that Thanksgiving break, end of November, December, they should be having that conversation, be thinking about that. I know for my son, uh, this last year, the decision was made in October of his fall semester, right? They, they were all kind of trying to figure out where they were gonna live, so it just comes up very quickly. So just know that it's there. Uh, as we head into the uh, semester break, the Christmas break, uh, a couple things I would say is, Think about this as halftime of a game, right? Halftime of a game. And at halftime you think, uh, hey, so what's going well, right? So talk to your students, hey, what's going well? What's, what's working, right? And then what are some things we may need to change? So another question for you, does anyone know uh, how many hours a week the average high school student studies? How many hours a week is the average high school student studying? Does anybody, anybody got any guesses? Five. Five. Oh. You're right. You went, we should give out a prize. Uh, we should. You got it right. So the average high school student studies five hours a week, right? Now, uh, what have you what have you learned about how much your student is going to need to study to do well at Baylor? Twenty. Twenty. Yeah, yeah. It's more than five, right? <laughs> so you're going to kind of get that twenty to thirty. We'll call it twenty-five. You know, it just kind of depends how many hours they're taking. The, the difficulty of the classes. I can tell you, if you want to make a 41, study five hours. Right? That's the path. It's really easy. Just study five hours, you'll make a 41. Okay? But if you want to make those better grades, you've really got to put in the time. Just think about that is a real shift from what they have been doing over the years, is going from around an average of five to a lot more hours. And so uh, that's a transition they may have to think through. The other thing, uh, this kind of quote that I, uh, I like, um, is that 70% of today's college students believe that they're in the top 10% academically. Matt Skill's a good Yeah, that's a good grade. 70% believe they're in the top 10% academically. I bring that up just because there, there's, and, and I can talk about this all day, but just this shift you know, from with millennials and Gen Z, you know, the expectations are so high, right? They are, they're out, that you're just really high. It creates a lot of stress and pressure for students. So one of the things you can do, really as parents, is you can be that voice of reason, right? Because they really need that, right? You can be that voice of reason to help them set realistic expectations. And then, um, just thinking more about the, the spring semester, Jim will talk more in detail, but just starting to have the conversations, is global education, studying abroad, is that going to be a part of your student's experience? Um, and then we know that students are a bit more marketable if they have um, learned a second language or begin to learn a second language. And then, what resources are you going to tap into? Are you going to... Um, as you have reflected on your um, ac on their academics, are you um, going to tap into some more resources that maybe your student didn't tap into in the fall, or are there some that they're going to continue to use? And then work experience. This is a good time to start thinking, are they going to work on campus? Are they going to work off campus? Is that something that um, is needs to be a part of their education? And just making sure that you begin those conversations as well. So a quick overview of the spring semester. Just know it goes by very quickly. We have lots of breaks. We'll come back there in January and we will celebrate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So there's a, a four day week there. We've got a week off for spring break. Uh, at Baylor we're off the, the Friday and the Monday uh, for Easter. So there's two four day weeks. And then we have something called DIA. Well there's another four day week. 
So really once you get into kind of late March, April, there are several four day weeks, long weekends uh, in a row. It's just, it's just deceptive. Right, it just it goes by very quickly, and students just really have to be focused and be. You know, I've had many students say, "Wow, what, where did my time go?" Right, so it just goes by quickly. Kind of going back, uh, uh, what Megan was saying about work experience. Really take advantage of internships. Be thinking about, uh, you know, they're going to have a job in the summer. Um, they're going to maybe knock out a few classes. You just need to be thinking about that earlier rather than later. So probably as you turn the calendar, you get into January. It's like. Mm, we ought to be thinking about what, what the summer is going to be looking like and plan for that. And this is a resource that I like to share with parents. It's called The Stressed Years of Their Lives. It's a helpful guide for overwhelmed parents and stressed out students um, for navigating the college years. You know, it's just a good, um, by uh, Janet Hibbs and Anthony Rostain, just a good opportunity for you to be aware of what your student is experiencing. And I like this book by uh, Gene Twinkie. Did it could die, could die. I like this book by uh, Gene Twinkie, uh, iGen. And um, it's just got a, a kind of a great snapshot of days of this generation. Uh, if you have younger uh, kids at home too, it might be really helpful uh, to think about them. Uh, I also wanted to talk a bit about uh, the Counseling Center. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I wouldn't be doing my job unless uh, I talk a little bit about mental health. Um, I, as I said earlier, my background is a psychologist and I've worked in the Counseling Center for over 20 uh, years. Uh, a few things I would say just uh, about this. Um, we have really, in the last few years, it changed and kind of adapted the way we think about our services. I think probably most people think about counseling in that traditional kind of 50 minute hour kind of appointment. We do a lot uh, of those types of sessions. But a lot of students are like, yeah, I, I you know, I, I don't want I don't want or need to meet at that level, right? They want something else. So we do a lot of one-time consultations. We have a lot of groups that are very specific to the things that college students are dealing with. For example, we, you know, social anxiety, or we might call it social confidence, right? You know, it's just kind of how do you how do you engage in just the social uh, environment that's here, right? That makes you anxious. We have some things around that, so we do some of those things. Uh, we are also available 24/7 uh, uh, to students. Uh, something that we have added, um, we added it last October that we're pretty excited about. Uh, as we were looking at the data on college students coming out of COVID, we realized that we needed to make services even more accessible. So we have a partnership with a, a third party uh, where we provide telehealth services to our students. And this is not <clears throat> just a brick and mortar here, this is really all of our students. You know, we have students Baylor in DC, Washington, EMBA programs. We have a lot of online graduate students. So what we have that's available, it'll, be available to your student for free and these these sessions these things are unlimited right is uh, virtual urgent care so maybe they decide I, I don't want to get in my car or whatever and go with urgent care you can do a virtual appointment it's available 24 7. we also have psychiatry and access to uh, dietitian services uh, as well through this also uh, counseling is also available in addition to what we offer um, some of the things about it that might be uh, more appealing to your student are uh, appointments in the evenings, appointments on the weekends, maybe appointments when we're closed. It's available to our students who are maybe studying abroad or our international students when they're home for the summer. Um, there's a lot of specificity and students can request a therapist or a counselor based on race, gender, language spoken, just all those sorts of things. So it's kind of really opened up some opportunities for us as we work with students. So in about a seven month period, we had 400 students take advantage of the medical services, and we had a little over 900 take advantage of the uh, counseling services. And our numbers, you know, we still saw 2,400 students, so we didn't change anything that we saw in our office. So I'm gonna talk, oh man, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason we have different mics. My projection is not an issue for me. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, care teams, <laughs> care team services. 
I mean, what we do for your students, the kind of the elevator speech is that we um, help connect students to resources for students who might be struggling with anxiety, depression, um, financial issues, relationship issues, suicide ideation, and anything and everything in between. Um, we've worked really hard over the last several years to connect um, with campus partners all over um, campus to be able to connect students um, to resources. There's four of us case managers here on campus, and if you think about the difference between care team services and the counseling services, is that counseling services re re uh, receives students in and care team services reaches out to students and so um, we have a referral system faculty and staff and students um, can refer either themselves or other students who they know might be struggling and then we will reach out to those students and let them know um, that we are here and that we care about them research shows that a student's life outside the classroom greatly impacts their life inside the classroom and so we like to make sure that they're connected to the resources outside the classroom um, so they can be successful inside the classroom. So then, at the end of the spring semester, here they are. They're back. So they will come home at the end of the spring semester. Um, and this really is an opportunity for you to receive them home into your home and they might be home for two weeks before they go off to camp or an internship or they might come home to work but they will come back so you do have to come pick them up in May of 2023 um, but this is really a good opportunity for you to let them sleep um, when they come home I think my daughter literally took a nap every day for the first week that she was home um, and then just do some reflecting about what are some things that went well this past year you did it celebrating those things what are some things that you would like to change and then what are we looking forward to um, in the next three years of your college experience um, and then kind of shifting to um, right now some conversations for you to have this summer um, what are your expectations around graduation you know your student might be here for orientation and line camp and think oh my gosh this is awesome I can't wait to spend six years here at Baylor and you're like uh, hold up a minute hold up a minute right and then what's acceptable achievement you know Jim talked about his conversation with his son just making sure they get anchored in a good um, with a good GPA from the get-go and then career aspirations making sure this summer you have conversations with them um, about their calling and what they are feeling good and how they're feeling about their major and different things like that and then <clears throat> like we've talked about they have been exposed to so many different campus organizations leadership opportunities and start to think about those things before they get here so that they can have a plan when they do get here and then do you have a contingency plan for success do you have a plan in your back pocket if something doesn't go well or something doesn't go as expected to help your student navigate that situation and making sure your student knows that it's important for them to have a plan in their back pocket as well so as we wrap up, I want to talk about this transition that's uh, ahead of you coming up here in August. And uh, just tell you a little bit about my own transition to college. I was the oldest. I have a, a younger brother. And, um, you know, my parents, I feel like they did a, a, a good job, you know, uh, uh, preparing me for that time. So as I got older, they would give me, you know, more responsibility. And as I was responsible, they would give me more and more uh, you know, independence. Well, uh, whenever they dropped me off at college, though, it seemed like everything that we had been working on to that point went right out the window <laughs> for my mom, right? And so starting with that very first day, you know, my mom uh, began to call and say, hey, I just want to check on you, make sure you're okay, make sure everything's all right. And I was thinking, well, it has, it's, it's only been 24 hours, but yeah, I'm, I'm good, right? Everything's okay. You gotta understand this is not like her at all, right? So, well, they should call the next day and say, hey, you know, just wanted to check on you, make sure everything's okay, make sure everything's all right. Well, you know, day one would turn into day two, turn into day three, week one, week two, week three. And she would call every day, right, to check on me and make sure I was okay. Again, not like her at all. I can remember my, you know, uh, I, I can't imagine what this would have been like if I had a cell phone back in that day, right? That would have been overwhelming. Um, back in remember, we just had that <clears throat> room with the phone, and I remember my roommate sometimes would be the one there to answer the phone. 
and they would say, you know, hey Jim, your mom called again today. Uh, you know, is everything okay at home? Right? She does. She does call every day. Well, you know, after about three weeks of doing this, uh, I lived in North Carolina. I made some friends from another part of the state. And uh, they were going to go uh, back home, right, for like a homecoming football game, and all their friends from college were going to meet up, and so they invited me to go. So it was my first road trip, right? And I thought, hey, you know, I'm an adult, right? I can do this. I don't need to check in with anybody. So I'm like, yeah, let's go. Well, so I uh, that Friday came, and you know, and I I headed out at noon to go to this other part of the state. Well, what do you think my mom did? Same thing she did every three weeks, right? She wanted to call, check. Well, she started to call and call and call. Well, fast forward, <clears throat> and this is the actual stadium where I was, right? This is it. And uh, it's halftime uh, of this game, and I can remember where I was, right? If you can see right up there at the <laughs> top right corner, that concession stand. And I was standing right there where the, where the grass met the concrete. And I was with all of my new friends from college and all of their friends who had come back from college. And I'm thinking, oh, this is it, right? I have arrived, right? <laughs> well, about that time, right, you could hear there was this guy, and he's coming through the crowd there at the concession stand, and he's yelling something. And as he gets closer, you can hear him say, Joe Marsh, is there a Joe Marsh here? Your mother is on the phone. <laughs> All my new friends scatter. <laughs> and I, as quickly as I can, without drawing any more attention to myself, try to get over this guy. And I said, hey, I'm here. You don't need to yell my name in public anymore. <laughs> and he said, well, your mom. And, I, and so what happened is, down here at the bottom left, if you can see that, that little tiny building, well, that was a, that was a bathroom, right? And, you know, there on the outside of that little cinder block restroom was a payphone. Right? And here's this guy, he's just minding his own business. <laughs> at this point, he's really wishing he'd kept it this way, right? But the phone was ringing. The phone was ringing and he answered it, right? So that was the longest walk of my life, right? Walking down that hill thinking, what in the world am I going to say to my mom, right? You know, kind of do what I done. We had a great conversation. We probably should have had it three weeks ago, right? Uh, she was, and again, I, I emphasize, not like her. Right, but she said, hey, I, I was just kind of caught by surprise. She was able to talk about it. it was harder than she had anticipated with me being the first one to go to college, right? I was able to talk about what it was like for me, right? For her to call every day and check on me and track me down out here <laughs> at this stadium, right? Had a really good conversation, settled into a really nice uh, rhythm. We would talk every weekend. And you know what? Uh, this is a picture of me and my mom. We talk every day now, right? You know, we talk every day. But but this is what we all want, right? We all want this lifelong relationship with our students, right? But a change, this transition is coming, right? Just kind of be mindful of it, be aware of it as you head into it. So then we're going to talk a little bit about the actual saying goodbye and the actual transition of um, what that will look like when you say goodbye um, after move-in happens. So have you pictured that in your mind? Have you pictured what it's going to be like? Are you going to, are you going to be the family who um, moves your student in and they have the new bedding that matches and the trash can and the desk supplies and all of the things? Um, and you're going to, the last picture you have is of closing the door to the residence hall and they're sitting on the bed and waving, all sitting all by themselves. And the picture you have is of closing the door all by themselves. Or are you going to be the family that says, you know what, let's go down to the parking garage and all say goodbye and have a big goodbye fest and the last picture that you have there is of them standing in the parking lot all by themselves waving goodbye to you so on your way back to Houston Dallas San Antonio Massachusetts in the rearview mirror all you picture is them waving at you in the parking garage or are you going to be the family that says you know what this is your time go and shine and join welcome week activities and do all the things find your people and spread your wings we have given you the roots that you've needed and now is your time to go and be the person that God has created you to be spoiler alert the third choice is the best one um, but really start to think about
about what that's going to look like as you send them out and you have done your job and you have given them the roots that they need and now is the time to give them the opportunity to fly and become more of who they are intended to be.